Well, those kinds of currents generated by th those devices, or I should say voltages, are very high, but they don't produce substantial current. So what we really need to use electricity in practical applications is the ability to generate direct current or alternating current. Now, direct current is electricity that flows in one direction continuously. And uh, we need a reasonably large currents measured in amperes uh, at not such high voltages. We don't need millions of volts or hundreds of thousands of volts. Usually we need much lower voltages, but we need higher currents. So what are the ways that we can generate larger amounts of currents? We can generate both direct current and alternating current by a number of means. Direct current, as I said, flows in one direction. A battery is an example of a device that generates direct current. Alternating current is electricity that flows back and forth. The power company delivers alternating current through its wires. Alternating current, the electrons actually don't really move very far. They go forward a, f a small fraction of an inch and then reverse and go backwards for another small fraction of an inch. And they just keep doing that, periodically reversing direction. The alternating current that we use in our homes and uh, is 60 cycles per second. So in other words, the electron moves back and forth in 1 60th of a second. So it repeats that cycle 60 times per second. Now the most practical way to generate both DC and AC for most for applications where large amounts of power are required is using magnetic generators. And most of the world's electricity is produced by magnetic generators. The principle of a magnetic generator is generator is very simple. An electric wi a wire moved through a magnetic field in such a way that it cuts through it in a perpendicular direction will generate a current in the wire. Here we see a wire moving down through a magnetic field between the north and south pole of a permanent magnet and that causes an electric current to flow such that the galvanometer or voltmeter or a current meter I should say indicates a negative current in the picture on the right, you see a wire moving up through a magnetic field, and you see a current flowing the other way uh, and producing a response on the galvanometer indicating a positive current. So if we then move the wire up and down, we would produce an alternating current. Now this is a type of a gener building a generator like this would not be particularly practical. Much more better is to rotate a loop of wire through a inside of a magnetic field. Now that is uh, more practical because it's usually easier to generate a rotational motion from some kind of prime mover like a turbine or other source of rotation, an engine of something like that. And so this type of generator is most commonly used. Uh, you have here an AC generator, a loop that spins. Every time the loop flips over, the direction of current flowing in the loop reverses. And so what we have there is a couple rings that pick up that alternating current and transfer it to the two brushes and to the wires that conduct the current away from the AC generator. Now if we need DC, we can use what's called a commutator, which is like a ring, but it's split in half. And that allows you to pick up the current with brushes also. But the split commutator switches the direction of connections to the brushes so that uh, even though the current reverses in the loop of wire as it does in an AC generator, by using the commutator the connection is reversed each time and that enables the output wires to have DC current flowing through them. It is uh, not a very smooth DC current. It varies from time to time in, in the cycle as the loop rotates, but it is DC, it is flowing in one direction, and so it's kind of called DC current. Now a practical generator doesn't just use one single loop of wire, that would be a rather weak generator, and so what we do instead is use many loops of wire. Also uh, the loops of wire have within them iron to greatly enhance or increase the magnetic field in between inside the loops of wire. And so we have what they call an iron core armature. The armature is the rotating part of the generator. In this diagram you can see 
labeled uh, C, where the you can see the armature and the commutator or the contacts with the brushes, and this would then be a DC generator in this picture. You can also see on figure A the picture of the magnets. The magnets in this generator are are electromagnets. That means that they have coils wrapped around iron cores to generate the magnetic field required for this generator. Uh, that gives this generator much higher magnetic fields than would be produced by most uh, permanent magnets. So the uh, magnetism is produced by the electricity flowing through those coils as well. A lot of times these generators are hooked up in such a way that they excite themselves. In other words, the generator generates its own current to activate the magnets. And so they uh, are able to be very powerful generators. Chemical energy is another way to generate electricity that's very commonly used. And, uh, for example, the battery or the cell. Light can produce direct current, uh, like the battery. Uh, light, such that we call these solar cells or photovoltaic cells. And they're used for many applications. Here we see a potential application where on the moon, Someday, people probably will use solar cells as a way of collecting the energy from the sun. Uh, solar cells could be used for a variety of applications. Here we see a car being powered by solar cells. Now, it's not a very powerful car, and it would, uh, wouldn't work very well on a cloudy day, but uh, they definitely do have cars, and they even have races of cars, races between cars with solar cells powering them. They're about the power of a bicycle, I suppose. Not very, not many horsepower, but uh, they definitely work. Photovoltaic cells work by the principle of using a semiconductor, uh, usually silicon. When it's exposed to light, a semiconductor will uh, you lose electrons from its atoms. In other words, electrons will be ejected from the atoms in the semiconductor, and uh, the top grid on the photovoltaic cell, which are some wires on the top of the crystal, pick up those charges. And the bottom of the uh, silicon wafer is mounted on another piece of metal. Now it is not exposed to light, so the electrons down there are not excited, and so they, but the charges re-enter the crystal from through the base. And so you get a current flowing from between the grid and the base the piece of metal that acts as the base, and this current can continuously flow as long as light strikes the the cell. And these type of cells have become quite practical, and more and more people now are starting to put these on their homes and office buildings to generate electricity as a way of offsetting the electric bill, although they're not yet real cheap, but uh, they're coming down.